All right, so we're on session three of our Revelation Bible study, and today we're going to be looking at chapters four and five, but I will start us with prayer, and then we will, I think we'll read because these two chapters are short enough that we can do that and, and talk about them. Probably moving forward from this point, there'll be some weeks we don't read everything, because I have right now planned chapters six through 11, and that would be a lot to read in one time. And we'll see if we even get through all that next time, because that's where all the really fun, yeah, symbolism is. So if we need to slow down, we can extend our study by another week or two. It should be an issue. Or, yeah. And if it is, we can work on the schedule. But I've got a prayer and a prayer. How do you go for it? Pray that as one is coming home this afternoon. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, they were waiting. Yeah. And they're waiting on discharge papers <laughs> earlier today, so that is that is good news. Twenty four days, I think she said that's yeah. been lost. Awesome. So, so yeah, I know she's um, I know she's ready to be home. I know she is. So yeah, we'll do that, and then we can we'll do more prayer requests at the end. But that's an important one to lift up. So let's pray. Gracious God, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together and to study Revelation. We just pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would be with us as as we read these wild and wonderful words and that the Holy Spirit would inspire our conversation and our study together. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so before we dig in to read, uh, just a couple of background things. Um, to have in our minds as we're reading. Uh, so if you actually read the first verse or chapter 4, you'll realize that this is where the revelation begins. Where it says, I looked, and there was this. And so this is where it begins. And um, the skull, one of the two scholars that I um, engaged the most to come up with my notes Describe these two chapters as a, a visionary diptych. You guys know what a diptych is? Two panels. Yeah, it's two panel. Usually they were altar yeah. works, and so they would have two visual things back side by side. And so he's kind of presenting this and envisioning it. I forget his name. I don't think this was N.T. Wright. I think it's the other guy. But he presents it as a, it's almost like here's this visual that you're supposed to see, the side by side visual. Chapter four is one. And chapter 5 is one. They're related to each other, but they're unique. If you read, you, you can see that. And so it's um, chapter 4 is, of course, about the heavenly throne room, about God the Father primarily. Chapter 5 is um, a vision of Jesus, who is also in the throne room, of course, but a little bit different. And so there's this section introduces those two images that will dominate the rest of Revelation in addition to all the other fun images that come. But I think it's, so the chapter 4 introduces the throne, and the throne of God appears 43 times from chapter 4 until the end of the book. So that tells you that's super important. And then the image of the Lamb, which of course is representative of Jesus, will appear 28 times from chapter 5 till the end of the book. And what these images do is they reveal to us the revelation. They reveal to us the theology behind this whole book. And so this scholar, and I think I agree, says that these two chapters are the lens through which you are supposed to interpret revelation. So what's communicated to us in chapters 4 or 5 is supposed to kind of give you that framework of understanding what's to come. I can't understand you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> come up here. No it's problem. It's like 3D glasses. You know, you get yeah. the red one that is like the throne and the glory of God. And you've got the blue one that is the role of Christ, you know, the authority of Christ that you're seeing through to give you the depth of yeah. perception. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. And so um, this is the, a quote from my notes um, about kind of this theology of the book of Revelation. God the creator reigns and is worthy of our complete devotion. 
And Jesus, the faithful, slaughtered Lamb of God, reigns with God, equally worthy of our complete devotion. So that's the underlying theology of the whole book of Revelation. And so, um, just with that in mind, we're going to read. We'll start with chapter 4, which is a theophany. Anytime you have God that appearing suddenly in Scripture is a theophany. So if you think back of like, uh, with Moses in the burning bush, that's a theophany. Or Moses, it happened to Moses a lot. He was uh -huh. like, yeah, Moses when the backside of God goes past. How do you spell uh, that word? T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Theophany. And it basically so just means like an epiphany, sight of God. Theo is God. Yeah, God. A God sighting. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God sighting in some way or another. So, and it happens quite a bit. Of course, most often probably to the prophets. Um, you have a lot of theophanies and prophetic works. So that's kind of a correlation to Revelation 2. So we'll read chapter 4 and then we'll, we'll chat about it. And then we'll go into chapter 5 after that. So if someone would like to read. Actually, I'll give you this. So I think Revelation 2 is meant to be visual. And so if... If someone if is willing to read, or I can read, and if you close your eyes and just try to picture what you're hearing in your mind, like imagine it. So someone else can read, or I can read. I can read. I don't mind. Okay. All right. So just okay. like close your eyes and imagine I, I this. Did as, that. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely see it in color. All its vivid colors. There's so much color in here. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, in the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had, the face, had a face like a man, and the fourth was a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So what what impressions, what comes to mind, what's this trying to communicate maybe is a better way of asking it. What, what does this chapter try to communicate to us about God? Majesty. Yeah, majesty. majesty yeah. Power. 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 Strength. Strength. The Almighty, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Father. Mm -hmm. Something interesting I read in my commentary was of the twenty-four. Mm -hmm. uh, said in my commentary said it was depicted of the um, twelve uh, tribes, mm -hmm. and then the twelve disciples, mm -hmm. both Old Testament and New Testament mm -hmm. combined. Mm -hmm. Yep. I had to add something to the Bible. To ask who? Who? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to put questions yeah. there. I know the seven lights are, you know. That's what I love about this Bible. Mm -hmm. It gives you, you know, you can look those. down and when you when you have those who moments, you can look down and usually it explains mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and so they also, so of course it's drawing from those 12, the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, but they symbolize more than that. They symbolize also all those who conquered. If you remember last week, we're reading about the letters and Jesus is saying, well, if you conquer this. So these are those who conquer, symbolic of all those who have conquered, who have repented, who have follow, followed the way of Jesus. So it's not just only 24, it's more of a, a symbolic number of the vastness of folks who have. Like a company of warriors. Yeah. Yeah, the clippers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're kind of the, the representative of the the priesthood, right? The royal priesthood, those who have, um, and because they're described as having right, white robes, which if you remember from that little symbolic thing, I gave you white is purity, and that they have also or victorious or some of the symbols of that. And it's just the holiness of God. Yeah. That, that only God is God, mm -hmm. you know, and and therefore worthy. Mm -hmm. Of our crowns of everything. And it, to me, it's like you know, when it's thundering, we pay attention. When it's lightning, we pay attention. When it's a blazing fire, we pay attention. You know, mm -hmm. it all gets our attention. Mm -hmm. So we we know He is the one, mm -hmm. and is and was and, and ever will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always loved that phrase: <laughs> the one who was and is and is to come. That's reflective, too, of God naming God's self to Moses. Moses is coming up a few times. In the burning bush, another theophany, when God says, I am who I am, right. which is saying, I was, I am, and I will be, is actually how you would translate it completely. Um, and so it's similar here. It's how God self-described God's self in the Exodus story here is being sung about. God by uh, those well, who surround the throne. Wasn't it in Isaiah that said God's word is and will never end? Yes. Right. Yeah. So in Isaiah, something, it says something that. like that. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you know, we have 365 days as a year. How long is this thing? The Word of God. Yeah. 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 And, so, and the idea I mean, of the endurance of the Word is important, I think, for a few reasons. We're told that God speaks and creation happens, right? So there's that con that connection of about speaking and creation. Of course, Jesus is called the Word, um, which is a of course, it's a Greek idea, the Logos, but it's drawing back to that understanding that we've developed in Christian theology that Jesus has always been, right? Because Jesus is one with the Father in our theology. And so Jesus has been from even the moment of creation. And so there's those, and then the idea of Isaiah that God's word um, has this eternal kind of value. It's all that same connection. I think that we sometimes forget this part because I think we like to focus on God is God of love, loving God, you know. Um, but I think we're limiting, <laughs> limiting God a little bit in that. And I think one of the reasons we do is because I, I think that, especially in this church, a lot of us have a heart for um, people who uh, are marginalized, you know, um, or people who are oppressed, you know. And so we can bring the God of love. We can tangibly bring the God of love. But I think that we are not tapping into what we can accomplish if we also remember that God is also powerful, the power, you know, of creation, you know. Um, and I think it's harder for us to think of God as power because especially as people who have some tender hearts, um, you know, I think that we think that, well, like, if I had that kind of power, I'd make rules for this universe. I would make a rule that no parent should ever lose their child, you know, that no child should ever be hungry, you know, yeah. that ticks should not exist. Yes. But, you know. Um, <laughs> all those, yeah, all right, the above. Right. <laughs> and I think that we tend to kind of minimize that because mm. that's too much of a discrepancy mm. in our understanding. You know what I mean? And so I think that this is a really good reminder 
and that our compassion can be better transformed and poured out if we also recognize the power of God. Hmm. Well, do you think it's maybe difficult for us to discuss that because um, talking to marginalized folks or trying to bring other people into the church, yeah. that would scare them off? Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. We don't want to talk about blazing fire. And, Let's only talk and, about the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, talk about the good stuff, you know, and let them figure out about the, you know. And yet I think the, the power, power is also the power to transform, the power to sustain mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. you know. The, the power lies in you. The power to, to, be, to move beyond these obstacles yeah. that are keeping us from trans, from unfolding the kingdom of God here, right here in front of us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The thing I keep thinking about is all these killings, mm -hmm. and yeah. all these hijackings, and, you know, and I keep thinking, why? Why are we killing lots of people? But maybe there's something we've got to learn, it's, and we haven't learned it yet. Yeah. It's in here. It is. Yeah. Father against son. But, you know, it's because he has the power, only he knows. And and the, and the, the seal, it's all about the, I mean, the scroll has all the seals on it, yeah. That we don't have the authority to crack open. Yeah, which, yeah uh, we're good too. Which means, to <laughs> yeah. me, what that means is, I'm not going to know in this life right. why yeah. bad things happen. And that's where faith comes that's in. That's where I say that. There's the F word. <laughs> right, there's the F word. Yeah. Yeah. The F word. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. So, I... Uh, Glenn's point kind of leads to what my next question is. I think one of the things that this is this vision is communicating is God's sovereignty, which is a word us Methodists don't use as much as our Presbyterian or Calvinistic yeah. friends use. We still believe in the sovereignty of God, just a little bit different than they do. Uh, meaning, when we I think in the, our kind of Wesleyan understanding, sovereignty is is that understanding of God's eternity, God's mystery, God's holiness. God is the supreme power, um, the creator of all. Um, and so if we remember one of the reasons why Revelation was written was that it was written to a people who were experiencing persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. I think this is meant to also serve as a contrast between the sovereignty of God versus what would have been known as the sovereignty of the emperor of the state. So what are some of the things, if we reflect on that, um, what do you think some of the differences are between that's trying to be communicated? So if we were to think that this was written to us today, if this fit in ours, so what's the difference between the sovereignty of God in our lives and the sovereignty of the government? One is temporal and not all knowing, and you know, yeah. um, the state. And are you saying the sovereignty of government as opposed to versus the sovereignty of man? Because I think man thinks that he knows everything. I think that's. I think those are one and the same. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we have. I, I, was say, I think that's why we empower government. Yeah. On some level. But now we have women. <laughs> yeah. Uh, May I talk? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it's very well, well, it keeps coming to my mind. mind. You give unto Caesar what is Caesar's God, what unto God, what is God. Mm -hmm. It's what keeps coming to my mind. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, it's ridiculous how much taxes we have to pay, but I have to pay because mm -hmm. that's part of life. So there's I also think, you know, with the temporal and the eternal, but I also think we have the limited yeah. and the unlimited. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Um, what were those two words you said? The lucid and what you said? Limited and limited unlimited. And unlimited. Yeah. Okay. So you could probably come Authority up with Authority or power, either one, you know. Yeah. There's always going to be powers that be, but God is the ultimate. I know, and it, it, it's funny because 
when my children used to be scared about something, I'd say, you don't have to worry about that because God's in control. He's going to win the end. Mm -hmm. Still, as they're adults now, I'm saying the same thing to them. God's going to win. We're not going to worry about all of this. It, you know, in this life, we have to suffer, and but there's so many good things to dwell on. You know, still say the same thing to my adult children. That that you know. Well, I think you said that to me on Monday, and I'm a grown up, and I needed to hear it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I think that it, that's part of this conversation, right? It's uh, you're experiencing this now, and it's temporal, it's temporary. God's gonna be victorious in the end, because that is, of course, another end message revelations portraying that God's going to be victorious, right? It's that promise. If you conquer is rely upon the fact that God's going to conquer. <laughs> we are only able to conquer because God has. And so I think that is communicating that those, those messages, those differences. And when we work out our faith or whatever, is that when, I mean, that would seem to me that's when the power of Satan then creeps in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think you see that in the letters. Yeah, you know, yeah. The yeah. Last two chapters. Yeah. Well, the temptations. And, and that will come up too as we get into the crazy, scary stuff <laughs> that's coming. There is the that difference too, because of course the image of Satan will come up in those yeah. um, things. So we'll get more into that, but well, um, God's sovereignty is unlimited. Man's is limited. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, so mm -hmm. you have to take, well, that, that was, I, somebody may remark to me the other day, I don't know, we got to talking about Noah's Ark, you know, and she said, well, I'll never go. Mm -hmm. It's not right. It's not representing the Bible correctly. It doesn't. No, it well, doesn't. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, it doesn't. <laughs> you were right. There is no way man could rebuild the ark. But the idea behind it, the message behind it, what God was capable of doing gives people a tangible idea of how mighty his power was. Right. You know, so you've got to... You know, it was man-made, and there's no way it could be 100% biblically, because God can only do that. Yeah, it's more yeah. of, I mean, they, they, did, it, they did it as well as they could to scale. Of course, it's not yes, made by the same wood and stuff. It's actually well, what no. they communicate within the ARC exhibit that. itself that is off-kilter. Yeah. That's, that's what I'll say about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't um, believe Noah's well, Ark's in here, is it? Not in Revelation. <laughs> and I believe that a lot of things, the Bible is not the history books. It's correct. And a, a lot of things that are in the Bible that I think I was taught as a child to be facts are not necessarily facts, but stories for me to learn from. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think we... <laughs> Judge told me one time, he said, the Bible is a road map to heaven. Uh, and, and so it's, and it, it may all, every, every word in this book may be true. But I think, it, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, I know through my life, I, I would say, okay, if Adam and Eve were the only two people on earth, okay, they had children, but... Why were not Cain, you know, why, why were Cain and Abel's, you know, where, where did their children come from, you know? Where, where, where did the wives kids? come from? Yeah, where did the wives come from, and so forth and so forth. Yeah. I told the whole story, or is it a story for us to learn? It's theopoetic. It's theopoetic. <laughs> Gwen's hanging on to that word from earlier, theopoetic. What did you say? I think it's theopoetic. I think it's, it's theopoetic, the too. Yeah, I mean, I... We won't go too much into this, but because uh, <laughs> we're talking Revelation and we've gone all the way back to Genesis, right. um, well, but yeah, there's yeah. probably there's similarities right between uh, the first book and the last book. In that, I think it's it's communicating a bigger a message, right? 
if if you try to make Genesis literal, you're going to have a really hard time with that. Because I, if you compare what's happening in Genesis with what's happening in the rest of the ancient Near East, you have a lot of overlaps. Like, you have the, uh, <laughs> the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is Noah. I mean, it's the same story. A little, there's some differences, right? And so... So Genesis really is a peop, the people of God trying to make sense of right. what their life, what how how things started, where they're coming from, how things began, and so probably from like I don't know, like Abraham on. You can't necessarily it's historical because there's little historical evidence of folks like Abraham, but that's trying to communicate more of a history than anything that comes before Abraham in Genesis is how I kind of would look at it. Um, but not history in the sense of verifiable, factual, we can, we know who was the, who signed the Declaration of Independence because yeah. we could see it. So not in the same sense, in the sense of this is where we've come from and this is how we've developed our identity as a people. So that sort of idea of history. Yeah, and I, yeah. I didn't mean to say that I don't believe it. Yeah. I do. I think it's, it's a wonderful book to dive yeah. into it a lot. But, um, you know, and, and my children have had questions, you know, and I had to answer those hard questions. Mm-hmm. And I had to, you know, I had to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I'm still learning. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a question. Go for it. What about the ancient Sumerians and the astronauts on the, on the, uh, the paintings and all on the wall? I mean, to them, whether it's an astronaut or another from another planet, I mean that could still be God. Yeah, it was their interpretation. Yeah, well, that's just yeah. like the the, uh, the Indians that were mm-hmm. in this country that lived in the caves and had their spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was their God, right. and right. it was probably our God too. Yeah. Right. That's what I think. That, yeah. And I, I was wondering if God. Had to wear a helmet. <laughs> 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 Who knows? I also think it's hard sometimes to. I think it's okay to shoot. I think she does too. Flying <laughs> <laughs> robes and uh, I think sometimes it's hard. I mean, I personally know people who they're not going to church. They think that we're all idiots because we go to church and blah 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 blah. And their lives are miserable. And I go, why don't you just give this a try? <laughs> why don't you just read a chapter? See if you feel better. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure what else we're supposed to do sometimes. Well, they just have the, they don't have the faith that we have. Burn up. We don't have all the answers no. either. We still question it. But we have faith because God has given us. I mean, there's signs of God that I see all the time. And there's things that have happened in my life that I know were God's control. So you can I knew when God was with don't me. have any faith because they've not been shown anything? No, it's not that they haven't shown anything. They, they just haven't see accepted it. it. They won't okay. see it okay. as being from God. Oh, I did that. That's what they're saying. Oh, I did that. Okay. You know. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a spiritual discipline to be able to acknowledge God's presence. I'm doing a spiritual discipline now, and that's the discipline they start with, is just practicing the presence of God, oh, taking nice. notice of where God is in your life. And I think that's something you just have to be, they, you, you, I think, actively choose to be aware of. Because <laughs> we can actively choose not to be aware of God's presence, too. Uh, so I think to answer part of that question, too, um, it, one of the messages Revelation, I think, 4 and 5 is trying to communicate, communicate too, is that um, we're created for worship, right? We're created to recognize God's majesty and sovereignty and uh, holiness. And that's communicated, I think, with the activity of the elders that are, you know, the 24, uh, as well as all the, the creatures, all right. Actually, interestingly, I didn't think of this earlier, but so with the creatures, you have a, a lion, an eagle, a man, ox. an yes. ox. So in Christian tradition, those have been symbols of the Gospels. Yeah. 
So, and I'm sure they pull that straight from this chapter to make that kind of connection. Um, but yeah, but worship is what is we are made for. Question. Was it your other question? I know, I know the one. <laughs> and I know the eagle. I always forget which is which. Yeah, me too. So, uh, ox and man, I was eagle is John, I'm pretty sure. I always get the middle ones, the other yeah. synoptic gospels mixed up. I think it makes sense that Matthew would be a, a lion because he he wrote to a Jewish audience in the Lion of Judah, which we'll get into as well in image here. But anyway, the other two. Who was mixed. the ox? That's the one. I, I think the ox. I think the yeah. ox is Luke, and the man is Mark, or it's vice versa. I always get those two mixed up. I'll have to look that up. I just know I'm not going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Until I, Until I. Uh, but are, were there any other questions that arose for you in chapter 4 before we move on? Unless you have a vision and step through a portal, like, you know, the writer did. Yeah. The revelation. I think as, as a young person, you know, I was, I mean, I was loved into the church before mm -hmm. I was even born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> most of us were. Some people aren't, but mm -hmm. most of us were. Mm -hmm. Were, you know, and uh, my mother used to say, no, you don't have to go to church. We go because we want to. <laughs> my, sure. mother, my mother, my mother, my mother would say the same thing. How do you answer to that? I well, wanted to say no. no she, had, she had another sentence that that. But if we don't thank God for what we've got, then you won't get. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure we're going from manipulation and revelation for, but <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, I was, you know, God's always been with me. I feel like He's always been with me from before I was born to this very day. Mm -hmm. No matter what I did, I always had a conscience that brought me back. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's some people just don't have that lucky, mm -hmm. you know. No. Yeah, what you describe is what we would call prevenient grace. And, um, you know, as Wesleyans, we believe that prevenient grace, everybody does have access to. It's, it's, have you come to an awareness of that grace? And that's where, for Wesleyans, that's where that moment of conversion, of awareness, of assurance kind of happens is when you recognize that, oh, God's grace is here. And then you respond to it. So, but yeah. But I think you have to have that reckoning. And I can remember two specific times when I was younger that I really knew the God's grace. Mm -hmm. And I think some people just don't have that. Have those times because they're not tuned into it enough. Maybe I was tuned into it and that's it. You were exposed to it, you know, just yeah, like I was. Way. I mean, exposed coming to, to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights, and then youth and you know, playing when off the piano, playing the piano, playing the piano. <laughs> Lance, I was having me on the piano by the time I was ten years old. <laughs> but you know, it's uh, and how do we expose? That's a good I question. Being a witness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? We reach a lot of people. In worship. In worship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, then we get you the prayers. Okay. And the message. Yep. But we'll go ahead and go to chapter five. We'll talk about our second image. So the first one's all about the throne, the second is all about the lamb and the introduction of the scroll, which we'll get more into next week when we talk about the seals. But if someone would read chapter five for us. I will do that. Thank you. Then I saw the in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root, the root of David has conquered 
so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. For you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God. Saints among every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Oh, so beautiful, it just brings tears. <laughs> I was about so to many ask. songs in those verses too. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's part of my notes. <laughs> so there's in in both of these chapters, there's three songs. So if you remember from the introduction too, I talked about how. Revelation is also a liturgical text. It's a it's a worship filled book, um, and this of course these two chapters are, in later chapters we'll get to express that side of worship, um, and so um, I have open here one of the probably favorite hymns. There, it's bass pulled from this section. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our songs shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful Almighty, God in person's blessed trinity. And then there's more, of course. Uh, we praise your name, all hell the power of Jesus' name, crown him with many crowns. What wondrous love is this? And so many more. Um, another song that popped in my head, it actually it's probably pulled from both four and five, is a contemporary song called the Revelation Song, mm -hmm. which even pulls in the rainbow imagery <laughs> in that song. And so... Southern Gospel group has released a new song uh -huh. called John the Revelator. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And it is. I've listened to it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, and how many songs talk about falling on your knees? Yeah. 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 Uh, many of them falling on your knees. Many of them uh, praise so, songs, honor and glory. So, yeah, and, and these the three songs that are within this chapter five, you have. Uh, a song that praises the Lamb, not just for rescuing us, but turning us from hopeless rebels into useful servants. And the second song is about the, all what the Lamb deserved, honor, glory. Um, worthy. Yeah, worthy. And the third one is about how the praise of the Lamb is joined with the praise of God, because the whole creation praises both in that last song. And so it's... It, Kind of like a building of theology too, throughout that work. And one of the things I love about the symbol of the lamb, especially as it's told in here, it's the slaughtered lamb, it's the slain lamb, mm -hmm. and even just the lamb itself, as opposed to the lion or the, it's the, or the, you know, ascendant Christ after the resurrection. You know, mm -hmm. it is the slain lamb, the one with blood. You know, the one that's died and died sacrificially, chose to die for, you know, everyone else, you yeah. know. And that's where the power is. Mm -hmm. The power is in the, the slain lamb. Do you know why Catholics wear a crucifix and Christians wear a cross? 
as Catholics believe in the yeah. crucifixion and we believe in resurrection. I think it's a both and. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Catholics also believe in resurrection too. Yes, they do. Yes, I, I think they're, they're yeah, well, they're, the crux of their theology is, is the crucifixion because uh, also they they emphasize more Holy Communion or the Eucharist than we do too, which is has a not that it's not connected to the resurrection, but it certainly is a deeper connection to um, like, the crucifixion. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting that they they think that the Eucharist represents the uh, literal. It is. Yes, it, it becomes. It is Jesus Christ. We believe it represents Jesus Christ. And I go, what the heck is the difference in that? Semantics. <laughs> Semantics. Exactly. <laughs> this question. Uh, Who would you die for? Who would you stand up right now? And it could be a horrible death. It could be a shot to death. Who would you stand in front of or beside of? And yet, that's what Jesus calls us to every day. Well, I, yeah. So, but I mean, you know. The first thing that comes up is your children. Well, yeah. And we were his children. Yeah, right. See, yeah. He, he died for his children. Oh, I had somebody ask me some time ago, which I'm still having difficulty with every day. And that is, if God someone who was made is made according to his it is for us to worship that is our I am here and you are to worship me worship me worship me do everything worship me they say how could you believe in somebody that that uh, what's she self-serving that self-absorbed why do you have to have a God that that says you must worship him I don't know. I don't know. I didn't say I don't know. But I don't even know what I said at this point. It's still a little boggling. Because that's the way to have everlasting life. Well, I think what I said was do you like all the bad stuff that's happening to you? I look at it and go, well, I'm going to think that I'm going to try this way because I live a much happier life. It's called hope. Yeah. Life. Hope and faith. And, but I think I thought that was interesting. I think it's not so much, and I'd have to do some digging, it's not so much that we're told to worship, so much as worship is a natural response to the recognition of the mystery and holiness of God. So in point in case here in Revelation 4, Never is God saying, or Jesus for that matter, and never does Jesus, by the way, say worship me, right. but he always says follow me. Never in this segment, that's why I said I'd have to look at other places in scripture, right. does it say worship me? Right. It God, just do. People fall down because God is worthy. Yeah. Worship. Yeah, it's a what worthiness. Example yeah. to follow than that of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what I always think of. He's the example to follow in life. He's our teacher forever, and he's he's our example for a better life. The other people pick other people, you know, right. to follow. I'd rather follow Jesus than the saints. And there's another song. I'd rather follow Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think too, like in our our Christian faith, I think raising up the the slaughtered lamb in the image of Revelation as being Jesus counters the idea of a self-serving God, right? Because God so loved the world that he sent his son that sacrificed God's self. This is not a separate entity. This is Jesus is God's self. No self-serving God expecting worship would sacrifice themselves. Same like emperors of Rome, since we're talking Revelation. They would not have sacrificed themselves for their, pe for their, for their people. For their yeah. So I think that that's kind of the, that's our counter narrative to that understanding of God being this 
self-seeking, self-serving. He does it. He does it. He gives us choice. Yeah. We are all given choices. And it's what we're exposed to, what we learn about, what we understand and don't understand. Mm -hmm. That I think um, everybody worships something. I know people that worship money. I know people that worship their vehicles. I know people that worship where they put their house, mm -hmm. you know, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I was just thinking, you know, I, I'd rather follow Jesus than have all the money in the world. You know, I have plenty. I'm, I'm comfortable. I, I'm not wealthy, but I'm not poor, but I'm comfortable. I have my daily needs. who worship money, you know, sometimes they jump out of buildings because they lost their money, you know. Yep. So we're not going to jump out of, Jesus isn't going to ask us to jump out of a building for them, you know, if we worship him. Uh, and if they're worshiping, worshiping their money, you know, which, which one would you rather follow? Or, you know, and there's, there's other things that people worship. Yep. Well, does their money or whatever they worship mm -hmm. give them hope and joy? Hope for a future. And promises. Not all the false idols. Mm -hmm. See. But Which have always the, been right. But right. with our faith. Cow. Yeah, but with our faith, we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. That's faith. You know. I look at somebody, I've had that question too, and I said, I cannot answer that. I have no idea, but what do you have faith? You know, just look at it and say, what do you have faith in? Oh, and that's why it's good for us to talk like this, because we get answers to these we questions. answers to questions and that maybe we can pull up if we can remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so other, any, any other thoughts or questions on Chapter 5? I've got questions, too, but I just want to open it up to see if you guys have any questions. Well, that I ran right across that I thought was interesting. For chapter five, we're talking about the scrolls. Uh -huh. And the one thing that I didn't know, the fibers of of the scroll, papyrus, right? Is that pronounced that right? Uh, they run horizontally on the inside. And that's why they rolled them up and put them on the inside, because the outside of it is vertical. But this one was written on inside and outside. It was. Yeah. 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 This one. Written on the inside and on and the back yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Somebody got well, crazy right it was easier to drive them up horizontally. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess they wrote vertically, too. But I, I thought that was interesting. I thought, well, well I they wrote the, on the inside. What those scrolls are written in. Very special God writing. Or yeah, Greek yeah. Or, we're not cold. <laughs> right. Or Italian. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Whatever we're not told. At the time, yeah. it was right in the Hebrew. <laughs> I mean, if this is a New Testament, it probably was, you know, Greek. <laughs> but, um, yeah, or Aramaic. So probably Greek at this time. But, but we don't know. They're talking about scrolls that, yeah. you know, were written at the beginning of time before that. So, again, who knows? I've never seen an, an ancient scroll. But in movies, it just looked like they were written on the inside. Yeah. 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 That's what makes this one kind of weird. Yeah, I think different. generally they were just written on the inside, but yeah, I think the. the oh, I saw that too. They are cool. I like this practice is the prayers of the saints are in a bowl. Incense. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I was just. I was just looking at that when you said that. Yeah. What you say, I like Mark? that part too. The prayers of the saints are gathered up in a bowl. Yeah. Yeah. And interesting. He mentions that somewhere else in scripture. But that's yeah. Right. The yeah. prayers are like an offering. And uh -huh. the, yeah. Incense. So when we pray, we can think, you know, they're not just words we say and that God listens to mm -hmm. and hears mm -hmm. them. Throw the prayers into the incense, so they burn. Yeah, the, the image here is that it's the prayers or that incense that smoke that rises up. That's kind of the image. I it's think it's trying to be. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. There you go. Yeah, so I think that's probably why 
um, churches that are more high church than us mm-hmm. have the censers that yeah, they yeah. take through the space, yeah. which is that symbolic, the prayers. Right. Right. The same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if you've ever been to a, a Episcopal service, and I have not into a Catholic mess that they've done that, but I know some do. Uh, but you get like agree. that overwhelming, yes, <laughs> yes. The overwhelming sense of that incense smell. The Orthodox, exactly. Orthodox, yes, yes, Orthodox yes. 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 And they do the big oh, censers too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, one of the the things that I think is trying to be communicated through this image of Jesus as um, both the the Lion of Judah and the slaughtered lamb is communicating that there's this reversal that happens. Mm -hmm. Because in our world, right, it's the most powerful who kind of usually win, but that's not the case with how God's work is. It's the one who was slain who overcomes the world so the the powers of this world are not going to be overtaken by the powers of this world the powers of this world will be overtaken through the suffering and death of jesus and so often so this is also a communication that this has already taken place because mm-hmm. jesus has already suffered and died so god's already got the victory mm-hmm. um and that also, if we remember that Revelation was is um, a book that is to help us be faithful witnesses, no matter what we face. Now, Jesus is being portrayed to us as the faithful witness, and so he's showing us the way, or he has shown us the way. So I think that's something else that's being communicated. Well, here's here. another question. Go for I it. Really I love like your I questions. questions. No, I love it. That is, and that's the only reason I come to Bible <laughs> The Bible also tells us, the, the new poem here, your yeah. buzz, just, yeah. now, on the other hand then, God expects us, he gives us all gifts, and he expects us to do the best we can with those gifts, and and to do something good and all for the, mm-hmm. for the world, and mm-hmm. with those gifts, right? Yep. So if you're constantly trying to be better and be good and blah, 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 are you then staying here? Yes, and here's how. Yeah. <laughs> Good, I need to know this. It's all about motivation. Oh. Right? So okay. I think when you're meek, you recognize your true place, right? So I think you can both be humble and know that God's gifted you, and those aren't necessarily in conflict because you know the gifts you have are only yours because they're God's, right? And so that's what makes you meek is that understanding that God is the one. Right, like I, I've been saying, that like God's the giver of all good gifts. All we have is God's. So that meanness is the understanding of all of who I am is because of God. And so I think that's kind of baseline for meanness. And so it's from that recognition that I think we can more fully live out and utilize our gifts as God intends for us to use them. Because at that point, they're not self-serving. They're... We use them to serve God and others. Not saying we don't mess up and serve ourselves, because certainly we will. But yeah, our gifts are going to make us better. Yeah, but our gifts might uh, make someone else's life better, or mm-hmm. might make the world better. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wasn't even thinking about meek like that. Yeah. I was thinking meek is shy and quiet. And yeah. Honestly, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, and God didn't make you to be, and so I don't expect God. To, <laughs> I don't think no, God so expects I you to be. Thought, oh, geez, I don't know. Yeah, and I think that's make me the most Yeah, let's see. What is? Yeah, you love your gifts. I don't know if mine translates it. Make you can translate that another way, and I don't know. Let me get to the VIP. Yeah, not mousy. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, that is translated as make your too. Yeah. <laughs> You're surrounded right now. I'm yeah, like, I think you could translate it blessed or the humble <laughs> rather than meek. Okay. And I think that's a, you know, I think our trouble with that word is how it's been used poorly. I mean, small, mousy, yeah, and not.
how the the and kind of biblical is done in submissive. Yeah. Well, we are submissive to God. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The the a proper submissiveness, I guess you could say. Well, patient long suffering. Oh, lamb like. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Lamb like. Yeah. Nice. Exactly. Yeah. Like Jesus. I like that. <laughs> Patient, long suffering, forbearing, resigned, gentle, quiet, shy, retiring, reverent, peaceful, peaceable, docile, lamb like, humble, hmm. lowly, unassuming. You said peaceable. It made me think of another connection to uh, chapters 4 and 5 in Revelation. It is actually in Isaiah, so maybe it's appropriate we did Isaiah and Revelation as our two studies mm-hmm. this year. Is There is that vision in Isaiah of the peaceful kingdom where right. the lion and the lamb I, lie down together. Yeah, and I think it this kind of symbolism about Jesus is tying that image. I from still the Old have Testament my notes from where we did Isaiah mm-hmm. today when I was reading. I thought, wait. Mm-hmm. Uh, wait, I got out my notes that I had, mm-hmm. and I thought, okay, Isaiah and Revelation have got a lot. There's a yeah, lot of parallels going Here's, on. Uh, mm-hmm. Verse 5, um, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah is the slain lamb. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. And the root of David, that's an right. Isaiah image. Right, yeah. right, right. Mm-hmm. And the commentary referred to Isaiah. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's I a lot of too, love connections there. Because, of course, John of Patmos would have been familiar with. Isaiah and Isaiah mm-hmm. looks forward. To, Isaiah looks forward to the ideal king in the lives of David, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. he must turn to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's. Yeah, yeah all Ezekiel. the all the creatures with the eyes. That's right. very Ezekiel. Yeah, right. I the love more eyes. <laughs> yeah, lots eyes. of eyes. So, like, we the our image up. of. Heavenly beings of angels, they look like us. But if you look at the biblical image of angels, they look nothing like us. They would be pretty scary. Yeah. <laughs> and I think these are all reasons why introducing the revelations is so scary. Yeah. It's like they just heard somebody say that several hundred years ago, and they've never looked up the information since. Yeah. Like, I think sometimes, too, a lot of preachers, especially ministers that are more evangelistic, yeah, uh, the ones that drag you out of your pews, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think they dwell too much on the Old Testament. I don't think they, you know, I think they think Jesus was in the Old Testament, and you know, the Old Testament's great. We've got a lot of things in there, but the Jesus New Testament, was in the Old Testament. Well, yeah, but you know what I mean. Yeah. They they still dwell on those. Uh, if we tried to follow everything. That's in in Leviticus, all, the laws. all those laws in Leviticus, and it, you know we don't follow those. Well, we're not under the law. Yeah, we're not under that. Well, they we really still are. You're right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some churches, some churches still preach that we that we still are under those laws. But and that's their choice. Yeah, that's their choice. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, um, I think. Um, I've been listening to the book, and I think I always mention to you guys the books I'm listening to when we do studies, but I've almost finished the book, The Art of Letting Go, uh, The Spirituality of St. Francis by mm-hmm. Richard Rohr. And um, it talks a lot about, and I think this is maybe something we're invited to when we think about worship, is to truly worship is a part of letting go. Um, and, and recognizing, I think, too, um, our, our place, the right place in the world, <laughs> as well as the mystery of faith. Because uh, there's really, you know, we have all the 800 and some odd balls in here that Jesus says to us. They're all in just these two, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what is that's what all the laws and the prophets are trying to communicate as simply as we can. And I think um, part of our letting go um, is recognizing that there's really nothing we can do other than just accept God's holiness and love 
and that we are loved and created in God's image. I think that's beautiful. I think too often we communicate that faith is much more than that. And it really is just simply that, and we let God transform us, the opening up to, for transformation. We can't transform ourselves. But in letting go, we allow that um, to happen. So that's just a bonus. I don't know how that, re- like, it's revelation. Somebody said something, and that popped in my head. <laughs> it's so free. That's free to you God today. God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's the connection. Free. Yeah, there's the connection. Letting God be God. So, so now that we've read chapters 4 and 5, and I, I share with you beforehand that this is kind of our interpretive lens for Revelation, how might that help us as we move forward and thinking about how to both read Revelation and also apply it to our lives? If you have any thoughts on that. Solidifies. Just through the abortus, which I may be what I have thought of this book. Mm-hmm. It's not revelation so far, and, and as I've grown older, revelation isn't as scary as it used to. I didn't want to read that. I don't, well, I don't want to read it. That's scary. Sandy, you know, <laughs> said she never read it when we talked about yeah, Isaiah. Because it was scary, you know, something bad is going to happen. <laughs> Well, it just solidifies my belief and my faith that God is a loving God. Mm. And God. he's going to win. And he, right. You know, no matter how my life turns out or what happens to me, mm-hmm. it solidifies my faith that I will see him. Mm. Even if it, like even if they do have angels with eyeballs and eight <laughs> Yeah, we like might be in for our pits, or we yeah, yeah, yeah. all over the place, it's everywhere. All of those well, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to look like. <laughs> so, all those eyeballs are so they can see everything. Right, it is. That, right. It is actually, yeah, it's symbolic like of being the other growing up. Exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, like that's funny. Uh, any any yeah. other thoughts or questions about chapter five? And they're just, both the four and five are just the introduction to what it's to come. They are. It's the build-up to the creation. So I will say this, because nobody asked about the scroll. So I'll say this, because yeah. the scroll is important when we get to the next one, other than we talked about being written on both sides. So, of course, we don't know what's written in the scroll, but if we were to um, look <laughs> to what's, what's to come when the seven seals get open, is that the scroll likely has written on it, God's eschatological, there's your big word today, God's, um, how how things are going to unfold, uh, God's plan of the unfolding of how God's going to judge, because there's judgment in Revelation, but, but ultimately how God's planning to save the world. And so when we start breaking the seven seals next week, that is that plan unfolding. So this, it's kind of like these are, Symbolic things that have happened or will happen um, in in terms of God's cosmic plan. Not saying they liter- are literal steps. We aren't to see it that way. But um, some of these things are and will be in that kind of redemptive plan. Because I think if you are to look at this as a whole... It is the story of redemption from beginning of creation to new creation. And the story of God's work to try to redeem God's people. And so that continues in Revelation too. As we get through. Do you think in God's time, the plan has come to fruition over and over and over again? Or we're waiting for the Mm -hmm. big bang at the end? I think that's a really good question. That is a very good question. Every once in a while. I think every generation (laughs) thinks their generation is. Yeah. We know all that And think that, oh, it's going to end tomorrow. And they predict. Yeah. yeah. They predict. Yeah. So, what's going to Pastor, hey. What's the end? Yeah. God wins. No. <laughs> what is the end? Where? 
if you look I at mean, Revelation, what, what? we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. um, that chapter yet. <laughs> yeah, back in 21, 2021, uh, heaven comes to earth, and there's a new, new Jerusalem. See, I mean, you know. We what? don't know when. We well, I don't know. Kind of could be individual for every person. Maybe the garden of Eden all over again. You might get to work in lots of flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. I think the the we'll get. I don't want to jump ahead. We're jumping the gun. We gotta get through all the seals first. But um, in in the end, with Revelation, it, there's this promise of God that I am. I will be with my people. And I think maybe that's. Whatever that is, mm-hmm. is the end, right? That 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 being That's in the presence I mean, of God's holiness. You know, what is? Yeah, the end? I, we don't know. Our human brains, we think the end. You know, the world's going to explode. There's going to be, you know, everything's going to just go to cosmic dust. Yeah. And remember what Revelation is. It really means a beginning, right? Yeah. So maybe the end is just the beginning. Well, yeah. and a lot of a lot of a lot of people want to scare us. Fear tactics are yeah. being used mm-hmm. through all generations. Daily. Fear tactics. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's daily now. I'm mm-hmm. not scared at all. Because I know if you know when my son comes to go or if I have a horrific accident or whatever, um, I'm just prepared. Yeah, I feel like I am too. However, I do fear for our country right now. I fear for the world, but I try to turn that over. God's going to win. Right, I just go, God is going to win. He's going to win. And every generation before us has felt that. Oh, right. I believe it says they don't want to have children now because it's too bad of a world and blah, blah, blah. I'm going, my son. Well, think about all the people that didn't think they should have children in another generation. And they did and went on to it. And we've had another, you know, five and ten. 20,000 generations since then. But if they didn't know what children they shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I just, I just, I, I don't, I don't worry. I worry about some things, but, but because of what my children might have to go through or my grandchildren might have to go through, but I know God's going to win in the end. Yeah. No matter, because there's nothing in this book that says Christians don't have to nothing in there that says we don't suffer. That we're spared from the first death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. We, are, we are protected by God's grace, but we, some of us have to suffer. Well, and these guys really were, because I was having a really, really hard time about mm-hmm. my own persecution, too. Mm-hmm. God, it's not that simple, is it? I got yeah, you. No, right. You're right, it does. We're just very, very fortunate to live here and now. Awful things happen to us, are awful to us, but we're still blessed. I cannot imagine not coming here on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And all the other days. You know. Judy is here more than anybody else. Judy, some weeks is, are, is here more days than I am, I think. <laughs> but I mean, you know. I wake up with joy in my heart, especially on Sunday, because I'm getting to come and worship with other believers, not family. I just, I can't imagine what it's like for the people on the other side of, well, everywhere, that don't have freedom yep. to do this. Uh, you know. It's like those women that have to get on their backs to walk around and mm-hmm. eat <laughs> while the men just wear whatever they want, you know. Or are stoned to death. Yeah, you know, just it, it just boggles my mind, you know, because I've been lucky enough to be a free woman. Uh, but there's a lot of women right here in the United States that I'm free. Laura was telling me a horrendous story this morning about something that happened in France, where a man was prost- was drugging his wife and then prostituting her, and it just it just blew my mind. Laura was in, in France. It was in France. She said. I was going to say, there are cases where it's in Texas. Yeah, and I told that's what I told her. I said, honey, it doesn't like just happen in France. It, 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 it can happen here, too. And those horrible things that go on in this world. And it was people just getting drunk and having sex. It was 
So it's, you know, I've been very excited. I haven't had these horrible, I've had bad things happen in my life, but not, you know, and that's not to say that it won't happen again. You know, some horrible may happen, but I know that God has been showing me. Which is the message of Revelation. Revelation. <laughs> so we'll end there today. Um, can you guys stop this and then we can do some more?